Sabbath Church family. Welcome. Thank, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Sabbath and welcome to our special Mother's Day program. We want to welcome you all. Thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful Sabbath day. This week's program is extra special because it is Mother's Day. We want to say a very special happy, happy Mother's Day uh, to all our mothers who are watching and listening. I would love to share a special uh, poem with you this morning. The poem is entitled, A Mother's Love. It says, there are times when only a mother's love can understand our tears, can soothe our disappointments, and calm all our fears. There are times when only a mother's love can share the joy we feel, when something we've dreamt about suddenly is real. There are times when only a mother's faith can help us on life's way and inspire us the confidence we need day to day. For a mother's heart and a mother's faith and a mother's steadfast love were fashioned by the angels and sent from God above. We want to continue to wish you all a wonderful Mother's Day. Fathers, children, it is up to you now. We have some announcements for you. 
from our church family. Uh, we would like to remind all board members that on Tuesday at 7 p.m. we have a board meeting. Be on the lookout in your emails for the special Zoom um, code. We also want to remind all the school constituency members there will be a meeting on May 18th at 10 a.m. Be on the lookout in your emails, of course, for the information about that. There is Wednesday prayer night prayer meeting that happens every Wednesday where we have an opportunity to get a midweek blessing. Please join us on Zoom. We would love to connect with you and hear how your week is going and, of course, to pray for you and our, your family members. There will be today at 6 p.m. a Revelation Bible study that will be happening as well as at 3.30 the young adults will be having a special uh, Bible study that is entitled Mental Health in You. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, your pastoral team is praying for you. I hope you have an amazing Sabbath day and happy Mother's Day to you, Mom. Our opening song is number 652, Love at Home.
the cross. Mama, știi, știi ceva? Te iubesc foarte mult. Știi așa ceva? Wow. Știu, am știu. Da? Da. Ok, e cam ușa să acasă. Și eu pe mine iubesc. Da? Tare mult. De atât aș sufer. Se Da, da. Mami? Ar, ar mai mult? Da, te aud. Ce faci? Te-am sunat să-ți spun că te iubesc. Da, e mai mult. Voi și faci. Bine, mami. Te dor de casă? Da, mi-e dor. Te dor, mi-e ca să nu e mi-e dor de voi, de cât. De cât. Sănătoasă ești? Da. Da, mami. Alo. Da. Salut, mami. Salut. Mami, eu te iubesc. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, we just came to call you that we love you very much. Oh, well, thank you. I love you too. From the bottom of our hearts. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
Mama, salut! Ha? Salut! Salut! Ce faci? Eu tot. Am sunat să spun că te iubesc și ne dor de mătale. Te iubesc mult. Te iubesc, păcă. Te iubesc. Prost, am sunat să spun că te iubesc. Ei, că te iubesc și vreau. Hai! Alo? Da, mă. Ce faci, mă? Abia că vă așteptăm, încă nu ne-am curcat. Bun, eu am sunat să spun că te iubesc. Dar de ce? Pur și simplu. De mă nu ți-am spus. Dar când ajungeți? Pe grabă, că se oră. Eu de asta știu? Nu, nu, pot să nu mai spui, eu te-am dat toată asta, aștept, te-am spus, nu mai spui. Bun, bun. Bun, hai. Alo, mă? Șobea. Eu te-ai zvonit și-o trebuie să-ți dați și ai tăpărit bine. Domnule, spasiva. Ea trebuie toată lucrurile, ea să-i tiri de tot. Ok, mă. Da, da, da. Alo, ma? Unde ești tu, băiatul? Eu te-am sunat să spun că te iubesc. E tale, n-a să-l bată cu iubirea mea și cu tăta mea. Da. Mulțumesc, mama, eu tot pe tine te iubesc. Ia, să știi. Și numai asta ar să-l spui? Numai asta, că te iubesc. By the end of 2019, it was estimated that a record 22 million people were displaced by disasters. These disasters came in the form of floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, droughts, and other natural disasters. Conflict and violence also contributed to the millions of people fleeing their homes for safer ground. 2019 was a demanding year for Adja. Our church humanitarian agency operating over 130 countries around the world. I just strove to meet the needs of those whose lives were endangered by disasters. From earthquakes to floods, from civil wars to refugee camps, Adra fed the hungry, sheltered, homeless, and ensured safe drinking water for the thirsty among the meeting many other critical needs. But Adria could not have done this life-saving work without our support. Every year, our church dedicates one offering as the Disaster and Famine Relief Offering. Our generous gifts today enable Adria to continue to show God's love and mercy to those in the darkest, most desperate situations. On behalf of Adria, thank you for the for your compassionate response today to the needs of families around the world. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I would like to share with you guys a scripture reading, Isaiah 49, 15 to 16. Can a woman forget her second child, that she will not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yeah, they may forget, yet I will not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms, of my hand, the walls are continually before me.
Here in my heart, and I know there can't be no greater love than this. I never understood. How merciful God could be Until I felt His flame Light every part of me And now I give everything that I am Cause I have been saved No greater love than this That you should lay down your life With someone such as me I'll spend a lifetime wondering why The beauty of heaven lives here in my heart And I know there can want to be the poster mom, but I know that that's never going to happen. <laughs> Ooh, I really struggle with trying to be perfect. I see so many moms that look like they're doing it the right way, and I've always dealt with perfectionism in my life, and so being a mom has multiplied it. There are some days where I feel like I'm not as compassionate as I feel like I should be. Um, there's other times where I feel like I am um, I, I, I feel like I just can't handle being a mom sometimes. And it's, there's days where it's just too heavy. Life just around me just feels too heavy. Uh, I struggle a lot. I struggle with patience. I struggle with time. When you have two, it's harder than the first time. So having mom guilt with not having enough of one or the other. I struggle a lot with enjoying all the phases of motherhood. And it took me a, a while to really discover. It, it was a huge effort for me to find what I enjoyed about being a mother and finding, finding that it really was my job and my calling to raise these three little babies. and. Um, yeah, that's, that's been a hard one, just enjoying motherhood. Her hugs, they're just the best, I guess. He makes me paint cakes 
for breakfast today. Probably one of my favorite things to do are, is um, play games with her and play games. Usually we cuddle together or um, color. She gets me to and from and she's never frustrated about it. She forgives me quickly and she uh, likes having girl time with me and she just likes hanging out and stuff. She buys me clothes and a house and food and other stuff. She's always there for me. I miss her when she's gone. Because I just know that she loves me so much and like, because she is, spends time with me, loves me, and she's the best and beautiful. It's hard to describe because she does so many things but it's like mixed into one. But when like we're baking, she um, is like just happy and I like it when she's happy and it makes me feel loved. Mom, I love you like so, 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 so much. Like, I love my mom to the moon and back 5,000 times. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. I know that this has been an unprecedented time and a very interesting church experience for each of us. Alobi, Mateo, and I really have missed and do miss our church family and trust that the Lord has been keeping each and every one of you safe and healthy and doing well during this time. Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to invite you this morning. We want to thank you for allowing us into your presence. We want to thank you and praise you for being a God that loves us, that has compassion for us, and that brings unprecedented amount of love and joy within our hearts. We want to thank you for the Sabbath day rest. And as we embark on what you would have us learn this morning, I just pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our ears and that it may be a blessing to each that hear this morning. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, I have a secret that I would like to share with you. I'm a mom now. Take a moment, think about it. I'm a mom now. So that means happy Mother's Day to me. I'm just kidding. But truly, tomorrow is Mother's Day. So kids, if you have not made those cards, planned that breakfast in bed, or perhaps husbands, if you haven't bought those flowers, Sabbath ends at exactly 8.46 tonight. I know Mother's Day will be different this year due to the pandemic, but as you celebrate mothers, mother figures, spiritual mothers in your lives, I pray that it will be just as special. Mother's Day is not an easy day for many. Our experiences with motherhood, whether it be as sons, daughters, motherless children, childless women, Whatever stage you may be in, I want you to remember that and remember that you are loved through this day. Oh, how reflective the Bible is of the human experience. So many women are mentioned with so many experiences. In light of this day, we remember Rachel, Sarah, Elizabeth. I have celebrated with friends who have held their newborn baby and found it simultaneously the greatest gift and the hardest task. We remember children like Benjamin and Joseph, whose mother died. I know children who have faced this day without their mother. We remember the women who never merited a name in scripture because they did not have a child to carry on the family name or the faith. 
I know two women, many women, who are facing miscarriage, infertility, and loneliness. We remember the Naomi's who demand, call me bitter. I remember the unnamed wife of Job. I know women who have buried their children, lives lost unbearably early. We remember the children and the parents whose relationships may be rocky. Today, the Lord, I ask that the Lord grant you countenance and give you all peace and understanding as you navigate and work through your relationship. We remember each woman who has found inner courage to face impossibility. May the God who mothers each of us be a source for all who long and hope. There are so many stories and circumstances that speak to our experiences. I pray that even as we dwell in the place of motherhood this morning, that this message may be a blessing to you. May God place godly people in your life that may lift you up each and every day. So I speak to you this morning not as someone who has mastered biblical principles on motherhood or parenting in my life. Heck, Alobi and I have only been at this for seven months, but this morning I'm endeavoring to wrestle with you issues that the Lord would have us learn as we explore his love through the love of our earthly mothers. My message this morning has two parts. The first, addressed to women, mothers, mother figures, and the second addressed to children. Our experience with God is not one that we can necessarily explain or literally show someone. It can be complicated and unexplainable because of its divine complexity. Explaining who God is and how he relates to us can sometimes be hard to see or comprehend. I would suggest that it may be made easier when compared to experiences in our lives and sometimes through the lives of those in the Bible. There is no other job in this world that is as heartbreaking and as rewarding as motherhood. I can think to the times lately as I have been taking care of Mateo that I will look at him and I will almost forget how small he was and then the pain that comes in realizing that he is growing and that small baby is changing before my eyes. Now, dads, don't worry, your day is coming up in a few weeks. But as we look at parenting, no other job will have the influence or the impact on the world like parenting. 90% of teenagers when asked who influences them the most still say their parents. The scriptures are filled with guidance and words that can be applied to parenting, and I know I have found them most helpful. Before becoming a parent, my work in youth ministries afforded me the opportunity to read books such as Child Guidance and Adventist Home by Sister Ellen White, and I found the following text most appropriate. Our work for Christ is to begin with the family, in the home, there is no missionary field more important than this. Adventist Home, page 35. So we are reminded that the parental influence can be a godly one or a worldly one and is of profound importance in the nurturing of a young mind. A mother's love for her children is one of the strongest and most mysterious forces in the world. It has been considered by many, studied even from a scientific perspective. Even mothers in the animal kingdom have been studied to explain how this mothering nature works, what drives it, how to explain its instinctual nature, how to explain the unconditional love that has become its mantle. Motherhood is nurturing, faithful, protective and sacrificial. 
I would like to assert this morning that it is one of the clearest pictures of God's love for his children. When I began to consider the message for you this morning, I asked myself, how do I see myself reflected as a mother in the Bible? The story of Hannah speaks to me the most, at least at this stage in my journey. We find her story in the book of 1 Samuel. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 1. We are told at the beginning of 1 Samuel chapter 1 that there was a certain man. Now when the Bible starts with there was a certain man, you know that God has something here. There's something cooking, there's something of importance that's going on. So we find here that there was a man named Elkanah. And we learn in verse 2 that Elkanah had two wives. You heard that right. He had two wives. Up to this point, the Bible, in the Bible, the track record for polygamous marriages has not been a good one. And this one is no exception. His wives were Hannah and Panina. Panina had children and Hannah was childless. When we are introduced to Hannah, we don't find her in the best state. We are told of her despair, heartache, and anguish. This is not a good starting point. How is God going to reveal himself in this story? The answer, faithfulness. We begin Hannah's story in a place of doubt, but quickly learn that she had a life of faithfulness. Her, both herself and her husband, Alkana, were faithful in their worship and, had sac- and made sacrifices to the Lord in Shiloh. In Hannah's story, it is described that she was in bitterness of soul. The Hebrew word that is used describes the emotional response to a destructive, heart-crushing situation. In Hannah's case, her lack of a child was comparable to a loss of a child. When I consider my journey to motherhood, it wasn't an easy one for me. When we decided to start a family, we were excited. But that excitement soon turned to frustration and pain. There were miscarriages, setbacks, and questions of whether it would ever be. There were times that I actually started to doubt God's goodness and the pain of losing the possibility of a child. I remember this feeling, the utter despair that came as yet again we were faced with disappointment. How could one find hope when they had a shattered heart? I can relate to the anguish that Hannah felt. Each month as results and doctor's visits ended with more questions and more disappointment. When we find Hannah, we are told that she was in a competition of sorts. You see, Alcana had children from Penina, and this must have been very difficult for Hannah to bear and to watch. For Hannah, this was made worse by the fact that Penina would mock her. Sometimes, my friends, we're not kind to those around us. We may not know the stories of the women that we ask the questions to, or perhaps joke with about when they will have children. Why are they childless? Wouldn't children make things better and make, things, make them happy? So I suggest this, let us be gentle and kind. Because sometimes we don't know the situations people are facing. As Hannah watched Panina and heard the laughter of children, the gleeful screams, I can imagine the experience of Hannah yearning to hold her own child, 
to feel the love and the warmth small arms and hands would give with a warm embrace. And then not knowing when the silent prayers would be answered or heard. For those women listening this morning and weathering the storm of conceiving, I feel your pain and I lift you up in prayer. Despite what others say and despite what even your own heart tells you this morning, I want you to know that you not having a child does not mean that you are worthless. Hannah knew that she was not because she took her problem to the Lord. Number one lesson that we can learn from Hannah is that she knew where to take her burdens. As the song states, take, the, take it to the Lord in prayer. Psalms 124 verse 8 says, our, whole, our help is in the name of the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. Because of her turning to God for help, Hannah becomes an example for us to imitate. Perhaps it's not the pain of struggling to have a child, but rather it's the pain of seeing your child struggling in life. It's endless nights of intercessory prayer for your children, perhaps who aren't in church. Maybe struggling with health afflictions or addictions. I want you to remember this morning that you have a God that loves you, that hears you, and endures with you. We learn in the account of Hannah the spiritual journey that we can face in life's difficulties. Number one, there may be the presence of an enemy or an adversary. In Hannah's case, it was Penina and her barrenness. Number two, we ought to direct our lamentations to God who can affect a change in suffering. As we continue in Hannah's story, we learn that she was not isolated in her despair. As Hannah wept, her husband asked her, why? Wasn't he better than 10 sons, he asks? So Alkana kind of does what almost every husband does when his wife is in pain. He tries to rationalize and to solve. He fails to sometimes listen to the pain of the heart. In fact, when you take the literal translation of his words, you see just how insensitive he is. He asks, why is your heart resentful? Am I not better than 10 sons? In other words, he's saying, sweetheart, you've got me. What more could you want? He's trying to solve the situation when he should be trying to understand the situation. Hannah found no solace in Alkana's well-meaning but inadequate sympathy. I'm tempted to ask a show, for a show of hands for husbands who've been there, done that, and then bought the flowers afterwards. But I won't. As a support system, there's a lesson here in listening. Sometimes a mother just wants to rant. She just wants to be heard. It wasn't that Hannah was not loved or cared for. Actually, despite her barrenness, she was in fact well taken care of. We're told that Alkana gave her a double portion. You see, in Israel, barrenness was a woman's and a family's greatest misfortune. The highest sanctions of religion and patriotism blessed the fruitful woman because children were seen as a necessary entity for the tribes and for the religion. According to Ken Malzak in the Andrews University Seminary Studies Journal, children were regarded as gifts from God and that a woman achieved a sense of purpose and an identity in life by having children. Hannah wanted to give her husband a child, but most of all, she wanted to give him a son. Her husband did his best to support his wife, but that didn't take away the pain. 
Sometimes, my friends, our pain is not truly seen or understood by those closest to us. But my friends, God understands. Psalms 56 verse 8 tells us, You number my wanderings and put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Hannah was desperate for a child, and she could have blamed God for withholding such a precious gift from her. But her troubles did not cause her to become angry at God, but rather her troubles drove her to a desire for God so that she made such a grand and most extraordinary promise to God. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 10 to 11, it says, And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the afflictions of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then... I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor will come upon his head. In reading the seminary paper, Malzak points out that we find four things in Hannah's prayer that we can take as lessons. And I actually believe that some of these can be taken as lessons in parenting. Number one, she says, look. If you will indeed look on the afflictions of your maidservant, she asks God to gaze upon her, to pay attention. So my friends, always remember, God sees us. He sees your needs, so trust that he sees you. Number two, she says, remember and do not forget. Hannah challenges God to remember her and to bring divine action into her seemingly impossible situation. Have faith that God sees you and will not forsake you. Matthew chapter 10, verse 29 to 31 reminds us, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall on the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Number three, Hannah is specific in her petition. She appeals for a solution for her problems in a concrete way. So be clear with your expectations of God because of his faithfulness. Remember, he wants the very best for you and your family. And number four, vow. Hannah's vow was not to attract divine attention or challenge God, but rather it was to express faith in God's ability and willingness to intervene in her plight. In the same way that God is faithful to us, let us too be faithful to him. Mothers, think of the prayers that you have made for your children that have drawn you to the foot of the cross. Do not cease praying and acknowledging the power that comes from our Heavenly Father. What we can learn from Hannah is that number one, God hears us, and number two, be bold in our faith towards him. What blessed Hannah in the eyes of the Lord? Hannah was a woman of prayer, and Hannah was a woman of faith. In the illustration of faithfulness we see in Hannah, first she had a prayer of dedication to her child even before the child came to be. You see, in the reflection of who God is, God has loved us from the very beginning. We live from the day of our birth in open rebellion against him, predisposed to war with him, incapable of pleasing or loving him, and yet God loved us, he chose us, and he set us apart to be his own. He gave us the ability to love him, 
And his love for us was so great, we see it manifested through his son, Jesus Christ. As a mother's love for her newborn baby actually awakens the nature of love in a child, so too does God's love for us awaken in us the potential for love. In Hannah, we have a mother that when blessed with an answered prayer, dutifully took care of her child till it was time to present him before her Lord. Hannah nurtured her child by dedicating him to the Lord. Many of us who are parents have brought our little ones for a dedication at church. And my friends, it is not just a ceremony that is a rite of passage in church life. It is a serious commitment. A commitment we make to God, recognizing our need for divine help. It is not just in our powers alone as parents that we need. Hannah realized that Samuel was not hers, but was a gift from God. This is why she returns him to the Lord. So mothers, let us continually give our children over to the Lord. Let us lift them up in prayer. This is where we see the nurturing love of God. It says in the, t in the Bible that can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. Hannah made a promise, made a sacrifice that God would actually truly understand. When her prayers were finally answered, she conceived and, and had a precious boy. No more would she be mocked for being childless. And true to her vow, she gave back to God the most precious thing that she had, her son. Her sacrifice pales in comparison to the ultimate sacrifice of God. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 5, verse 6 to 8 says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we learned that we had finally conceived, there was joy, excitement, and a surreal feeling. The reality slowly began to sink in. God had answered our prayer. And was preparing to give us the opportunity to partner with him in raising a child of his. I can't tell you when I began to change or take on mothering attributes, but what I do know is that there was a fire and a drive in me that I would do whatever I could to protect this baby. Parents know that they will do anything for their children. But what happens when you can't? We learned at the end of our second trimester that the road to parenthood was not going to be a smooth one. There was basically a complication. We were now faced with the daily fear that, of what would happen. We had a number of hospitalizations and prior plans, some of you might know what those were, were canceled and some were put on hold. Each run to the hospital would bring fear and a determination to rely on God to protect our little one. What I learned through this experience was that there would be times where neither Alobi nor I could do anything except rely on the protection from God. 
This was brought to a head on the day that Mateo was born, when he had to be rushed to the neonatal intensive care unit. Oh my, how earnestly we prayed. It wasn't just us that prayed. It was our loved ones, our friends. Friends, remember to pray for those in your community. A united prayer can do wonders in uplifting those that need help. You see, when we go back to the story of Hannah, Hannah may not have had to physically protect Samuel, but she did protect him spiritually by not only promising him to God, but by bringing him to the temple as she had promised she would. In our time of need, we prayed for God to protect Mateo. I'm sure many of you have experienced God's protection in your life. Perhaps it was protection against health affliction, financial stress, protection from harm and danger while you were traveling or in an accident. Whatever it was, we have all at some point asked God for protection. During these times, we can take comfort in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous ha right hand. Or first, um, Psalms 91, verse 11. He will put his angels in charge over you and protect you in all your ways. So where does my story end? Well, it doesn't. This is what I've learned so far. In everything we went through in trying to conceive a child, to bringing Mateo into the world, we came to realize that everything is in God's hands. Our child's conception was to be in God's timing. My pregnancy would be sustained through God's protection, and Mateo's life was in his hands. In the end, God is in control. Today, I speak not only to the mothers this morning, but to the fathers too. What great gift is it to be a parent? What a great responsibility. It's an amazing honor to be given a precious gift that to help shape and mold. And fortunately, we aren't given an owner's manual. Better yet, an owner's manual specific for your kid. But as earlier I said, Alobi and I have only been at this for seven months, and I can only imagine what lies ahead. We have heard stories from many of you in our church family, in our community, those with grown children, teens, and toddlers, that it's not easy, but you find joy in your families. So this morning, if you are sitting with your children, hug them, kiss them, remind them that they are loved and they are cherished. Mothers, Remind yourself that you are a good mom. Cut yourself some slack. Dads, remind yourself you are a good dad and that you are doing everything you can to provide for your family. We have a God that wants to help us in the most important task. Like Hannah did, take this up with God. Partner with him, lean on him. He knows your children even better than you will ever know them. He loves them even more deeply. How reassuring is it to know that there is someone that loves your children and wants to receive them and give them the best care. We may not see the fruits of this immediately, but our faith in the power of who God is and the resilience of, the Holy, of his spirit, we can have hope. 
We see through the story of Hannah the reflection of who God is. When Hannah moved towards God, God removed shame and humiliation. It is God alone who can affect change. We see three characteristics of God here. His holiness, his incomparable nature, there is no one beside you, and his trustworthiness, he is a rock. We have the nature of motherhood exhibited through the nature of God. His nurturing, his faithfulness, his protection, and his sacrifice. A mother is nurturing. A mother is protective of her babies even when they are old. Ask my mother. A mother is loving. A mother is a rock to which her children can run for shelter. A mother is a teacher. A mother is a physician who mends her children when they are ill. A mother is a mentor providing an example for her children. A mother is a guardian angel who watches over her children. A mother is a friend for her children to confide in. A mother is the biggest supporter of her children and a mother is a reflection of God's own heart to his children. No mother is perfect. Children, we will be let down at times by our mothers. But because of the love that is in us through Christ, we love them for the ways they have nurtured us, been faithful to us, protected us, and sacrificed for us. Children, I want to remind you this morning that God created our parents for our benefit. Can you grasp that for a moment? Your mother and your father, as tough as they are to understand at times, want the very best for you. And they are a gift from God to you. And you are part of an authority structure that helps you be the person who God wants you to be. The Ten Commandments states that you are to honor your father and your mother. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 to 3, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. In verse 2, it says, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. And verse 3, that it may be well with you, that you may live long on the earth. So whether you are a young child or a grown child, be patient with your parents. They are trying their best, and remember to thank them. A day like Mother's Day is literally a culturally acceptable day to make declarations of appreciation towards our mothers. You can write her a card, you can give her a phone call, you can take her out for brunch, for dinner. This is obviously before COVID. But I challenge you to make these declarations of love daily because the mothering never stops and the intercessory prayers on your behalf never cease. This morning I realized that we are not all the same. We have all had different journeys as mothers. The Bible illustrates so many experiences. Perhaps you are a Sarah who was the mother who endured or you are a Hagar the mother who, in, who endured. Perhaps you're an Elizabeth, the mother who believed in miracles, or a Jochebed, the mother with a plan, or perhaps you're a Naomi, a mother-in-law who shares her faith. I don't know your story, but the God who loves us knows your story, and he cares for you and your families. As I've said before, earlier in this message that no relationship is perfect. Your relationship with your parents, and in this context, your mother, is not perfect. No mother is perfect, but love will overcome mistakes. First Peter chapter 4, verse 8 says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. So love one another. Fathers, 
love your wives and love your children. Mothers, love your husbands and love your children. And children, love your parents and obey them. All in all, we must remember, as, in, as 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says, we love because he first loved us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for being a God of love. We want to thank you for giving us such incredible parents and parental figures in our lives to help us in this life's journey on this side of heaven. We know that it is not easy to relate to one another, but we know through your love and your perfect love that we can find a peace and an understanding and a nurturing, and we want to thank you, Lord, for your protection and your sacrifice. We love you, Lord, and we pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing song is number 524, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus.